was 2014 to 2018. So I'm doing my career retrospective. My fucking internet died or something, so I had to uh, start a new live stream. I don't live stream every day, by the way. <laughs> I really only do it about once or twice a week, if that. So I'm doing a career retrospective for my birthday, showing some videos, showing some old videos, reading old stuff, reading new stuff, reading from journals. Showing stuff from City Life, doing System Lord stuff. Not that my life ever is not like a festival of the arts. That's pretty much all my life is. It's like an ongoing festival of the arts. <coughs> the more I can be an impresario. And uh, just book stuff, host stuff, you know, the more uh, I will do that. So I'm reading for myself included. Poems 2014 to 2018. I want to read my poem, Burrito Bowl, which Ashley really liked in her friends, which I'm kind of surprised by because I thought it was offensive. <laughs> I haven't read it in years because the title, Burrito Bowl, <laughs> sounds kind of, I don't know, appropriative and racist. <laughs> but in any case, Burrito Bowl. I skip America this time. I don't mean to be insensitive. I'm not, I'm not, you know. Uh, to me, it's a metaphor, and it's like the cornerstone of my diet. Practically half of what I eat is burrito bowls. It's, a, it's the perfect meal. I really think it's the perfect model of food, and my art is kind of like a burrito bowl because it's like you're taking all these different things, you're getting all these different varieties, all these different kinds of nutrients, textures, food groups, you're combining them together. You know, to me, you have a melting pot, you have a salad. To me, America's a burrito bowl. <laughs> it's not a melting pot. Nothing melts. I mean, maybe it should, but if we could make it a burrito bowl, I don't know. Is that a good... <laughs> Everything tastes good together and complements each other while maintaining its own integrity or whatever i don't know not that that fucking matters <laughs> maybe it should be a melting pot but um i i don't know in any case burrito bowl is the metaphor you you deduce what you want from the metaphor you know what i mean and it's la i mean la hugo's tacos right greatest shit ever <laughs> Burrito bowl. It's the perfect food. I skip America this time. Arrive like a shuffled ear. I can barely listen to an entire song anymore. I can barely fall in love for longer than it takes for the, than the sub, for the subway doors to close anymore. I skip this thought and go on to the next. I'm searching for something, and usually I find it, and I must find it again, and I must find it again. And I must find it again. I listen to your voice on the phone. Or listen to your voice on the plane. A recording I'd taken on my phone. We won't talk about that. Arid California bashed with sea. Palms imported from Araby. Screenplays zilched in sunstroked MacBooks. Starlets and tachycardia in the baked potato roads. The day is jewelish, the traffic bewitches. A cop car drives by, scalped of lights, black X's over the badges on its doors. LA, even the cars are sad and in costume. Kaleidoscopic graffiti cartwheels the underpass, Lucille Ball in a falling hall of mirrors. Plaster Versailles collapse, segueing epochs. I don't move that fast. Caught in the sleeper hold of my brother's apartment, I'm falling into the matinee dream of a nap. I take the metro, LA's tropical tramway, palm tree columns holding up Hollywood Boulevard to amoeba and find song lines and war of art on the dollar racks, my only place in society. I'm a discount bourgeoisie, lunch specials and cups for water. 
library cards and dollar stores, Medicaid, unpaid taxes, earned income credit. I used to be an actor trapped in his headshot. Now I sleep in the grass and I read. I eat eggs, I eat pad thai, I eat a burrito bowl, guacamole, chicken, rice, and beans. See, the poem should end there, but I go on. Life, I'm no longer listening to you. This is not a collaboration. I'm going to do what I want, even if it kills me. I'll pass on your bounties of cooled wisdom sitting in every open window like pies nobody wants. I'd rather read Apollinaire's unstitched war wound, his thin slit mouth sprouting blood. I'd rather learn from a lazy paperback how other men have made my mistakes before me. I'm not inventing new ones. They suffered for them like I will suffer. And that suffering can be composted with words. I get about 10 minutes of good reading in a day, if I'm lucky. People tell me my mind is tired. I don't think so. So that, uh, I don't know. There's like sincerity in that poem. It's about, I had just flown from Florida where I dropped my girlfriend off, never saw her again, <laughs> to LA. So, you know, I listened to your voice on the plane at recording I'd taken my phone. And then I go to LA and then whew, all this. This is all what I'm talking about in the poem. Amoeba, the tropical tramway, palm trees holding up Hollywood Boulevard. That's all this stuff. I took the metro from... My, my brother lived in the valley, which was horrible. It was way better when he lived in um, Atwater. But he moved to the valley, and it was horrible. So I walked from his house to, like, the train. <laughs> it was like being at Universal Studios. The fucking subway out there is literally like... One of the, it's like Disneyland. It's like those fucking, or it's kind of like an airport tram or something. It's like carpeted, you know, the fucking, it's just a weird Epcot Center kind of vibe or something. <laughs> uh, Jurassic Park, the ride. I'm glad I have this little portion of our lives on film because going out visiting with my brother in LA when he lived out there, those were very special times. I'm glad he got to live out there, you know. He, not that he enjoyed it necessarily at the time, but uh, <clears throat> it was fun to go visit him. I like L.A., you know, I don't, and I like, it, it's fun to have L.A. episodes, right? It's like a classic television show kind of thing. You got some episodes where you go to L.A., <laughs> shake it up a little bit, you know. And uh, I like doing travel episodes, you know. I like doing portraits of different towns and stuff. L.A. is kind of a... It's a thread that runs through the whole show. There's the L.A. Story episode. So these, this is way before that. This is a whole other lifetime. This is 2014. This was the first episode that I did that I was really like, oh, if I put this with this and this, I can build it out and make like a 28-minute long thing rather than just like these little one or two minute, you know, this is filmed almost like a scene. I've got reverse shots. I've got cuts. There's, you cut to me, you cut to the thing. At this point, I was doing video professionally pretty regularly. So I was in work mode. I'm going to shoot this. I'm going to shoot B-roll. I'm going to do da, da, da. And editing was more, you know, I'm, you know, there's a lot of cuts in this. I was trying to make everything super short for the internet. <laughs> this is my brother's apartment in the valley. where, uh, And so this is 2014. The L.A. Story episode is January, February 2020. <laughs> That's six years later. 
you know, way, a whole lifetime. That's when I got my divorce. <laughs> so this was, you know, they were still married and happy and having a great time. Here we are going to Pasadena, that beautiful freeway out to Pasadena. Hiking, you know, that's like half of what you do in L.A. You go fucking hiking. And I don't know. It's just beautiful. I mean, there's a reason why the fucking movies are out there, right? The light, the landscape, the variety of it. And so... This episode really kind of came together with the music and shit. The burrito bowl. <laughs> uh, do I have any other L.A. fucking shit in here? I don't know. I get excited by that kind of stuff when it's like things recur. That's what I'm looking for in a weird way. I'm looking for patterns or just sort of like rhymes, resonances, coincidences, right? Synchronicities, the kind of strangeness of like place, how the place kind of is still there and yet the relationships, the people who travel through it have changed completely. This is Burbank Airport. Uh, you know, going to L.A., all these different trips, it has totally different meanings and, and uh, presences and purposes and dramas, and it's a theater for different sort of things. The New York and the show is sort of a more consistent... Brooklyn is sort of like the home of a lot of it, but here I am arriving at, where was I flying back to? Columbus, I think. I was going to work in Columbus. Uh, let me read some of this shit. Okay. In Lichen Headaches. So this is August 26, 2015. This was right before... This was the beginning of shit really hitting the fan. <laughs> you know, I can't... Uh, it's weird. I can't... Every time things start to get sort of good, it's it's hard to believe that there could be, like, success. <laughs> because I'm almost 40, and my whole life has just been rejection, you know? That'll drive you insane. In like and Headaches, Monuments to the Founders impregnated whole house with garden angular the spattered chair zithering the string into place compartmentalized art monastery has keeps to prove it most religious as family came to sacrifice for obliterating fame and the dream pick of mare with grimace in a cage I noticed the panels of the floorboards, how they cut the light into thin, singular planes. It was a house of laundry, twisting between administrators. Change is the flux who doms habitually. Wrote a cartoon about it, which sounds like your comment. I want my songs to stand up that way, too. Weirded out and scribbled with cheese. So these poems are about living in the sluge. I, this fucking hard drive doesn't have a lot of the videos that I want to show. All my all my videos are on YouTube. I can't. I don't have the internet on my computer, so I can't show a lot of the shit that I want to show. But anyway, this is from uh, <laughs> these poems are about living in the house, right? Monuments to the Founders impregnated a whole house with garden. That's the way I felt about living in this compartmentalized art monastery. That's what the sluge felt like. It felt like a compartmentalized art monastery. Has keeps to prove it. So there was this medieval keep next door. This wall with these like stained glass windows. So it felt like this art monastery. You know, it felt like we were all monks making our illuminated manuscripts or whatever. which are TV shows, and our vlogs, and our live streams, and our chat books. So there's Jake and my brother. This was sort of like his bachelor party in reverse. <laughs> he came to New York. He, like, messaged me out of the blue. Hey, I want to come to New York at the end of the month. I was like, okay. 
I didn't think anything was up. I thought he just wanted to come visit. There was a string of years where Jack, John Ryan, Jake, and me were all in New York like the last weekend of August. After my brother's bachelor party. This was like early 2010s. You know, like 2012, my brother's bachelor party. He came to New York. We went to Chinatown Fair. We went to uh, Fat Cat, which is now called Cellar Dog for some goddamn reason. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like that was a whole lifetime that was five years, you know, in New York. This was the tail end of that. You know, this was like one of the last times I remember John Ryan coming to New York. And Jake I haven't talked to basically since 2017. <laughs> We've exchanged Instagram. It's weird how the pandemic like is like this moat. It like put this gulf. You know, 2017 is six years ago all of a sudden. The last Holy Smoke show was February 2017. And that's around the time, that was the last time I talked to Jake. That was six years ago. That's kind of nuts to think about. Um, once again, your relationship to the place changes multiple times. You know, the lives I've had in New York. I've been here since 2010. When I first got here, I was auditioning for commercials. I was doing improv classes and shit like that do an RSD, working in restaurant. The next phase of that was like video production. I was writing plays. This is when a lot of these poems, if you read my Route 33 manuscript, that's poems from like the first time I lived in New York in 2011 and whatnot, 2012. This is more like from, this was like a golden era. This was the Brooklyn years. <laughs> 2010s were the Brooklyn decade. Brooklyn felt like the center of the cultural universe. It felt like Paris, right? Everybody seemed to want to be there. Nobody even gave a fuck about Manhattan, really. It was like... And so to have our little thing in this beautiful brownstone was totally like a fantasy and a dream, you know? It was a... Even though maybe people that I know now don't necessarily know about this period of my life, that's the point of doing the retrospective, I suppose. Like, this was a major thing, and these videos are the work. They're the archive, right? They're, it being sort of an ephemeral, almost theater-type experience, or like a happening. I was reading about happenings today. Um, the video is sort of like the the material substance and the fossil or the, uh, you know, the thing that has survived the, in the amber or whatever. And so, uh, you know, the whole sludge thing in of itself was almost like a theater. It was like Brecht, <laughs> whatever the fuck his theater was called. I can't remember. The People's Theater, the Open Theater, some shit like that. Um, this was our big kind of circus of performance art, rock and roll, poetry, everything, parties, uh, you know, entwining our lives with that, making it a reality show, making it a film. You know, this was before I really started to write diary works. I wasn't writing about Caitlin or, you know, people in the house per se. I didn't get, you know, I wasn't, quite this was pre like new york school for me not i mean i knew about frank o'hara and all that shit ted berrigan and whatnot but like this was i really got into new york school like kind of right after this new york school became more of like a surrogate it was like masters that was where i got my mfa <laughs> i got my mfa from the new york school sincerely i mean even though i you know didn't have any teachers really uh, this is a poem I wrote in like 2008 about Jack, John Ryan, myself, and Jake hanging out at our apartment on Hudson in Indianola in Columbus, Ohio at the very end of college. You know, so I'm trying to go back as far as I can to when I was 23, 24 and bring that era. Being 37, you have all these layers, right? You have all these different lifetimes you know i played music audible detonation that was a whole thing i played with willie phoenix i played with jack chocolate babies 
played at Comfest, you know, I did Shakespeare, I did sh films, independent films. Uh, and then, you know, most of my adult life, I'm proud to say I've lived in New York. Like, at this point, I feel like I have kind of like, I don't know, pulled my roots further away from where I came from, which I think is kind of important. That stuff doesn't go away, but learning to do it here, and, and I don't know, it's been important. So this is the compartmentalized art monastery. This is the keeps to prove it right here. This, this wall with the ivy on it and shit. Uh, most religious as family came to sacrifice for obliterating fame and the dream. You know, lichen headaches are like weed stuff. <laughs> They're good headaches. They're just smoking tons of weed, you know. Look at John Ryan. Now John Ryan, this is before they got married. Now he's got a kid. He lives in California. He lives in Lemoore, California. One of the things that's important about the vlog, I think, is tracking through the years, just tracking people's course. You know, it's an interesting way to see how your life, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting tool to just see like, oh, that's where I was. Here's where I am now. I mean, I'm doing pretty well, I gotta say. You know, I, I thought when this shit was going on, I thought we were gonna take off. <laughs> I thought people were gonna find out about the sluge and we're, you know, my show's gonna blow up. <laughs> this was 2015. You know, at this point, it's eight years ago almost. It's kind of crazy. I'm coming up on a decade of scenes from a life. I'm thinking about what I want to do for the 10 year anniversary. <laughs> 2024 will be 10 years of scenes from a life. And, uh, you know, at this time, people were sort of annoyed that I filmed them. My brother's always been pretty cool about it, but, you know, they've never really loved my show. I think, like everybody, they think it's kind of weird and, like, too much information, narcissistic. Like at the party, or at, at, at Ed's house last night, I won't mention who, but they were kind of being specific about their assessment and they're like oh it's a matt proctor thing they said they went sh kind of shallow down the hole the matt proctor hole <laughs> on the internet they took a shallow dive and uh they said my work they checked out system lord and they said it it shares uh with my work like in kind of unedited uh prolific quality <laughs> which to be honest is something i only recently started to do the pandemic was really where I started to be like, okay, now we can just put everything out because everything was online. And to be honest, one of the big influences on that are the Grateful Dead. You know, the Grateful Dead's body of work is 3,000 fucking shows because you can get on YouTube and get online and listen to every fucking concert they ever did. And people do. And so I want people to think about system lord and and this in the same way you know it's not i mean is it narcissistic to put your whole life on fucking the internet and think everybody does it <laughs> i feel like i'm one of the most tasteful people at this point the way people are narcissistic on the internet is like completely disgusting and tacky the way that i did it was like sophisticated and artistic you know, it's not, you know, how, how much am I even in this video? Most of it is them, really. Uh, you know, I was trying to write a novel about my life and, you know, these characters with video. And so when I host it and when I talk, it's really like the novelist saying so-and-so was thinking this and here's why they did it. You know, that's me stepping in as the narrator to say, here's what the fuck was going on. I don't do that anymore. Now I just put the whole fucking, I put my whole goddamn camera roll on the show and I just put it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
I'm very tasteful about the ways I'm narcissistic. You know, I turn it into art. <laughs> Other people just turn it into commerce and just like self publicity in just like the grossest way. You know, but I've come pretty far even from this, you know, like not that it's a measure, but like our lives have come a long fucking way, you know. Uh, God, I don't know if I really even want to relive a lot of this stuff. <laughs> what else have I got? Okay, this is a good one. This was a stunt I pulled in 2014, 2016. So this was the beginning of hell. 2016 was the hell year for me. It was when Trump happened. So this was Olivia who I was... Everybody was in love with Olivia. <laughs> she was a femme fatale. And so this was our poetry battle. We did this... Our friends, Eric's friends, were in this band. I forget what they were called. They were not really our vibe. <laughs> But we had like this fundraiser at our house. The sludge was our house venue. So this is it. This is the basement, the lights, the whole deal. This is the heyday, right? This was the very end, really. And, um, oh God, there it is. <laughs> and so they like wanted to do their fundraiser. It was some kind of anti-Trump thing or some kind of f women charity or something. I don't remember exactly what it was. But, uh, you know, of course we wanted to support it. So they were doing their show, and we thought, well, we'll just jump on with our poetry thing. So I thought, well, we do it like eight mile. <laughs> you know, we'll get in the basement. Olivia and I will go head to head. She'll read her shit. I'll read my shit. And uh, we'll let the audience decide <laughs> who the uh, superior bard is and who the, uh, the champion is. And so, of course, she, like, destroyed me. But look at me. There I am. That's frankly fabulous. That's me and all my, like, <laughs> 2016. Look, I'm wearing the Make America Read Again hat. <laughs> I was in kind of full satirical Trump mode. I was making fun of Trump big time because I thought that was the way to beat him. That's why, you know, I, I kind of, like, was doing that. It was, like, a, a funny joke at that point. <laughs> but, um... You know, at the same time, I was, like, torturously in love with Olivia. And so, like, this, I was extremely nervous. I wanted to impress her. You know, I wanted her to think I was, like, a poet at all. You know? Which, like, I didn't think she really respected. She definitely was knocked out. Our story is long and crazy. I won't go into that at this point, but... You know, I was I was def definitely trying to like get her approval, and uh, <laughs> she's my twin flame, basically. You know, it's it was that situation, and you know, it, even this, I just felt at the time like I'm just embarrassing. Like, look at me, I'm wearing this cheap suit. I I I deliberately did not like crease the bill of the hat because I thought that was like cool. I thought that's what, like, cool, like, street people do is, like, they buy the hat, they keep all the stickers on it and shit, you know, to keep it, like, like it's just off, like, it's just off the shelf, like, it's mint condition. So I was trying really hard to, like, <laughs> I don't even, my, my idea for this character was it was, like, Leonard Cohen meets Ric Flair, and then the hat was just kind of, like, I liked Travis from uh, Paris, Texas, right? Harry Dean Stanton from Paris, Texas. He wears a suit, but he has a baseball hat. I thought that's kind of a cool combo where it's like a suit is like, but you're kind of, you're kind of de-professionalizing uh, the suit by putting the hat on, but you're also kind of like still fancy because you're wearing a suit. Like a, tr it's like a, I don't know. It's kind of, white trash but in like a stylish way <laughs> you know i'm white trash what can i say I, like my my roots are basically like hillbilly if you want to go back far enough and so that kind of swag <laughs> um the rick flair but also like some kind of poet maudet 
in a suit. You know, like Nick Cave wears a fucking suit. David Berman would wear a suit on stage. So this was like, look, I mean, how could you live it any more intensely than this? I mean, it's Valentine's Day. She's got a boyfriend, for Christ's sake. <laughs> you know? She's got a boyfriend that, like, at this point, they were on their way to being engaged. And yet... We were on fire. I was on fire. And she was, you know, she was having a good time definitely toying with me. <laughs> and it did kind of force me to, I felt the need to like make my poetry, I don't know, I've always felt the need to make it hipper. Being in New York in the 2010s, being exposed to stuff like all the Ben Fama shit, Adam Fitzgerald, Ariana Rhines. Shy Watson. There's a lot of pop culture. There's a lot of Steve Rogan. You know, there was a lot of pithiness. But also that was a part of my life. That's a part of my own interest. Pop culture, trivia, you know, including all of that stuff. Being able to talk about David Crosby or... I read my poem... Um, Last Christmas, which I wrote with AI, actually. Let me see if I can get a copy of it. Let me get it. I'll read it right now. Okay. Yeah. It's the last poem in my sex book. So, like I said, the sex book kind of completes the picture of these years. And so, uh, Last Christmas was a poem I wrote with AI. And I read it at this. She beat me. She clearly beat me. <laughs> it was, you know, not really a contest, I suppose. She's got that Veronica Lake thing with her hair. You know, like, you were just done. You were just done. Last Christmas, a collaboration with myself by Measy.biz featuring Frankly Fabulous at Shoyish. Disclaimer. I am the biggest piece of shit ever. I write all my own t-shirts. Poon job, foot job, cripple epic. Blog, foods which no longer exist. This, that, I don't have a real job. Being born was non-consensual. Wiped their ass with my chin. The years went on in statuses. The sonar of emotions. Ricochet biscuit. I only trust beloved childhood figures. Michelangelo, the Ninja Turtle, not the artist. The professional wrestling circuit. Never joke about Denver. Left an orthodontist at the altar. Junk put onto shelves. You can always rely on accidents at the opera with porn stars. All women are Disney princesses. And I'm vaccinated by the nipples. I'll be a rich man when they make the biopic. It's cool, then it sucks, then it's over. I don't know. Not that that's like a battle poem or anything, but... Uh... God, this one's only a minute long. Do I have full episodes here? Let me see if I can get some full episodes. Uh, uh. Here we go. Let's see what we got here. Okay, this will be good. So this is the moving out episode, I guess. Fe Valentine's Day, so this is two years later. <laughs> Uh, see what difference... It's hard to believe this was two years. Because, uh, a whole lot of shit happened in between. But, most of this book, I guess, was written kind of further along, closer to this time. Um, after I met my ex. This was around the time, you know, I was experimenting with psychedelics. And, uh, so maybe I should read some of these future my ass should i read all my acid poems bicycle day 
Future My Ass, Will Smith understudies 9-11, Instarazzi tonal screeching the demons in my lair, slandering potential fate accompli, worst kind of pretentiousness, singing is the new not singing, Play, being playful with the environment like the baby, I mean shameless everywhere. Krishna Murti eavesdropping a joint into the piano wire. You must be the sun. You must go to Paris. I know that I would do well in Paris. Distract and in so doing focus on what you're trying not to care about. It's the lesson of a neighbor's voice. The only thing I can feel at night when you're gone. How's that look? You gonna be able to see me at all, or maybe I'll stand up for a second. Not any good at all, or let's try this shit. I had a hard drive with footage from a work trip in San Francisco in 2017 that died. That's one of my biggest regrets. I wish I had that. Because I have this poem, Work Trip, that really needs that footage. Suave Archive. Having a process corrupts that process. New types of Paris internal with dead bodies. Blue dube crushed a few months, ready at the morning for our first drunk. Do this to here, that to someplace else. These globs of hardened chunks partake to board, not to spark. Gloom Elizabethan moat upon your eye. This clicks with what's on, so you can tell later without help or knowledge. Tribunal gull skidding the blue. Pencil-held belt squeaked rubber on your bill. The hose floods the garden. God of Haines loves their early spring, shouting into white homes as it goes from threat to adherence. Genius chosen is, run tell that. Received come up and to back into the kick. Ronald Cole and the trillionaires know all the good shit. Rejecting what's criteria, so warped into normal criminal roaming sarcasm of the constant moment. It comes as it goes, interior. So it comes, so it seems. Bring it closer, maybe. Should we try to get closer? Let's try this. I'm retooling the setup here. This could maybe be a better. So, yeah, this is clearly. Uh, oh, was at the opera with my ex. This is still the only time I've ever been to the opera. I liked it. That's cool. I like this. This will be good for... Uh, the internet. It's trippy. Uh... Alright, here we go. The Chelsea Epiphany poem should be in this book, too. I don't know if I ever typed that out. Maybe that'd be a good one for the for a chat book. At this point, I still had my film director glasses. Oh, I can't really read it. Broadway Metropolitan Outrage Alert. Grin me, I was wrong. Entitled Utnapishtim. Like he was a treasurer. What acting? He make it past the past. Decorative tradition acts. Choice A is by all rights, sedition and contraction. Worked hard to separate from teasing. Now it's in charge. 
fictive idiom is what arrived back, what re-arrived, what arrived again. Oh shit, here's my walking papers. Comparing assholes to oranges. Melancholy is an old mood. Play it again, Sam. She must have given him an apple in sleep. She gave me all six people I need. Round square, table, annals of gibberish. Nobody in climbing. What if I... Can I put my face over my own face? <laughs> Can I put my face on my own face? Ah! Diary of an Outtake. Someday the prologue will be over. Light held in escrow in scrawny apartments. A willow stolen lengthwise, swaying to a shoegaze metronome. I die of night. A broken bohemian tacked to the baseboard pipes. Fish wandering the ceiling. Buttons crude in the burial soil. Enter a glossy parade. Warped binders eating my sixth grade one centimeter at a time. There's a bird in a shoebox beaten with a hammer. An urge reaching a long gone finger. Ghost closed, just dust playing on a contact lens. Winter was up half the night fighting in the other room. I drank the block, turned right on red, gas moving into the key. I want non-sequential living. Moments jump cutted to further moments, silver rings me mediated by a glass of stars. Getting room toned on a prepaid calling card. Let's hear our blood travel the length of the veins. Gritty cells tumbling like a can of whispers. Words sorry for teaming up that way. I dumb down into shocking grace and tell those monkeys to go back to space. Be blank and leave an anonymous corpse. I am nothing but my own comparison. Leave it out overnight and a singing appears. How's the city treating you? I begin by not sightseeing. Mud skippers worshiping the river bank. Angels of the fish tank. A feathered star lives to live. It's basically a sensual robot. Man's visual toy rolling like a basketball with feet. I wonder if the Guggenheim's line runs holiday long today. Free or pay what you want, which to me means $3, six to eight Saturday. Not a huge portion of the week. Little window of the poor to look at Agnes through. The stone is an altar or smushed basilica. Bones talented enough to domicile the miraculous. The stone of this building and that one and that one too. Think I'll watch you be theatrical on YouTube tutorial. Get some tabs to disorder the senses. Though it's only 10 a.m. on a Monday and I'm not even awake and don't even know how. Look at that fucking haircut. I wish I would have realized a lot sooner that I could cut my own hair. That's something that people should empower themselves to do. At any time, you can cut your own fucking hair, okay? You don't need to go to a barber. I could have just shaped this up whenever I wanted, and it would have looked a lot better. But this was deep Trump era. This is 2018. So this is March 2018. This was right before... Well, this is when I moved out of the sluge. That's what this whole episode was about. This is one of the pivot episodes, right? There's a few episodes throughout where you can see pivots of action. To be honest, the beginning was a pivot. Because when I started doing this show, uh, was when I decided, hey, I'm going to live in New York full time. I'm no longer going to go back and forth between Columbus and... Uh, oh, the shadow is like on the fucking screen. Um, I'm no longer going to go back and forth between Columbus and New York, which is what I was doing in 2013. I'd spend a month in Columbus, a month in New York, because I worked in Columbus. And uh, in 2014, I just said, no, I'm not going back. I'm going to try and make it here, you know.
So in the early episodes, you kind of see that conflict. You see this back and forth on the Chinatown bus. You see working at Media Machine in Columbus. Over the years, that becomes less and less. But this was something I knew it was a big, you know, the, the subject of the first few seasons and really what my life was about in a way that in retrospect, I mean, it was amazing. It just felt like this is the ultimate thing to do. The 2010s, when, when I moved to New York, it was all Brooklyn girls, two broke girls, whatever the fuck that show was. And so the ultimate thing like it seemed to do was like, let's do an art collective in Brooklyn in a fucking brownstone and we'll make a TV show out of it. We, it was something we had talked about since I moved in. Everybody in that house was talking about, we should write a script about this. We should write a script about, oh my God, we live in this fucking house in, in Park Slope with all these artists and it's crazy. So I just filmed it. I just said, okay, I'll just make the fucking show. I'll just make a rough draft. Here, I wrote a poem in my closet. <laughs> this was one of my, uh, this, was a, this was a Ted Berrigan. See, I was deeply, this was when I was most in touch with New York school, I would say. Like, I hate the way my hair looks there, but I'm glad I had it like that for a time. You know, you have to go through these changes. You have to go through these metamorphoses and try things. I could have made it look better, but it was about being rock and roll. Look at those big mutton chops. This was around the time I won the uh, award. It was like a, a few weeks after this that I won the uh, the free speech award here. And I get a good uh, 